This person is from Flushing. This person is in here. It's the boss. Yep. I wonder if she brings baby boss. There's more people I know here. should have known, I guess, <laughs> judging by the names on seats. She's a What? What's a door? Places. Where? Good evening, everyone. Thank you, first of all, for coming out to the opening night performance of State of Emergency. Uh, my name is Andrew Morton. I'm the artistic director of Shop Floor Theatre Company. Thank you. I don't usually uh, talk before the show, but I just want to say a couple things uh, tonight. As some of you may have seen as you were coming to the lobby, uh, our stage on the screen out there, we're actually live streaming our performance right now. Uh, through the new Play TV channel online. So I want to say, first of all, hello to our friends that are watching in Detroit and Ann Arbor and anywhere else who might be tuning in with us this evening. Um, I want to say thank you for uh, sort of participating with this. This is the first time we've done this. I think it's really cool and exciting that our audience is not only kind of here in the flesh, but also outside and joining us via the internet. Uh, what's really cool about that is when we have our post-show dialogue after our performance, we're going to have a, a kind of conversation with people outside of this venue too. So I just want to remind people who are watching online that you can join our dialogue uh, via Twitter. So you can sort of tweet us with comments and questions during the dialogue to at shopfloorflint and include the hashtag new play and flint SOE uh, for state of emergency. Any questions or comments and when we have our dialogue we'll kind of uh, try to incorporate some of those into the, the discussion. Uh, there will be a, a 10 minute intermission during the show and uh, when we go into the second act we'll kind of go straight into the dialogue and the discussion, so I hope you will stick around. We really consider the, uh, the dialogue and the performance part of the same uh, event. We want this piece to be very kind of conversational. There are going to be a lot of questions that are asked this evening, and um, we hope that you'll be ready to, you're going to be spoken at for quite a while, uh, so we hope afterwards that you'll be re ready to talk to us as well. So uh, if you're coming in, feel free to come in and just find a seat, and I'm going to hand over to, uh, to one of our cast members now, Brittany Reed, and she's going to tell you a bit more about how we wrote this show. So um, thank you again for coming, enjoy the show, and uh, I'll hand over to Brittany. Hello. Welcome. Thank you all again for being here. My name is Brittany. I'm one of the actors in tonight's play. This is a play that's been developed over the last few months using a style of theater called verbatim theater, which is where a script is created using information from recorded conversations, interviews, blog posts, news articles, and other found sources. A lot of what you're going to hear in the play is part of our research on Public Act 4, the controversial Emergency Manager Law. Thanks for that. Um, anyway, so we want to kind of get started by giving you a taste of how we made this play. You may have noticed, some of you who came in may not, but some of our actors have been walking around with a questionnaire with some of the questions we used as research for our play. So we want to hear some of your answers. A couple of my friends are going to help me with this. These two will be walking around with bullhorns. So if you want to respond, you can speak into one of these. So everyone will be able to hear you. Right? So the first question we have is, 
What does democracy mean to you? Who would like to respond? Democracy is having a say in the decisions that affect your life. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to weigh in on this one? It's okay, we're all friends here. It's cool. <laughs> what do you guys think? I, I think the core idea of democracy is uh, that the group is wiser than the individual. For me, it's all about engaged and informed citizens taking responsibility. We are brought up in a society that greatly values the freedom to express ourselves. When things go wrong, you can't just walk away. One of our audience members said, um, what does democracy mean to you? It means the freedom to choose an elect elected representative. Yeah, pretty basic. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm glad that I live in the United States and I have a participatory democracy. I mean, flawed as it may be, we have the right to choose, and it's much harder in other parts of the world. Democracy is a wonderful concept for organizing a government, but it can often be messy. Another of our audience members responded, democracy means every voice is heard and valued, no matter what race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, etc." Right on. So this is, this is the kind of idea here. We just want to open up this conversation, and we're really interested in what you, the audience, have to say. Like, making this kind of theater is an interactive process, and the community is a really big part of that. So I'm going to throw out another question. This one might be easier or maybe less controversial. But we want to know what you think constitutes an emergency, anything at all. problem you can't solve on your own. In the back. Absolutely. Did you have something down here? Absolutely. Did everyone hear that? He said a situation when, when it kind of comes to a head and reaches a point of emergency where you have to make a decision. Down here in the middle. Absolutely. We were at um, Beecher High School yesterday and the kids said something as simple as like when the police come. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what constitutes an emergency? It's uh, something extraordinary by definition. Something that challenges the ability to cope with the demands of the situation. Katrina was an emergency. I, I think the loss of manufacturing jobs in Flint was, is an emergency. Well, you can use whatever superlative you want. One thing of which I am certain is that public education in this country is in a state of emergency. One of our audience members said, what, const what constitutes an emergency? People or a circumstance in extreme danger? Well, when I think of an emergency, I think somebody's being affected imminently. It's a danger. Somebody needs assistance. Another of our audience members said, what constitutes an emergency? When the government wants to take away my gun rights, charge me $4 for a gallon of gas, no jobs, no money. Oh, wait, that's happening now. <laughs> emergencies are unavoidable. I think a lot of things that are considered emergencies are not really emergencies. Emergencies evoke certain responses out of people. And I think a lot of things are deemed emergencies just to employ fear. Hmm. OK. So I think that's enough to kind of give you a sense of how we made this play. 
So if I can remind you to kindly switch off your cell phones, devices, if you have them, we'll begin our play. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present State, State of Emergency. Emergency. Michigan Public Act 4, also known as the Local Government and School District Fiscal Accountability Act, was signed into law by Governor Rick Snyder. In late September, Governor Snyder appoints a financial review team, which finds that Flint is facing a financial crisis, financial emergency rather, and that no suitable plan is in place to see the city's financial needs. The Treasury Department determined that Flint was in violation of nine out of the ten criteria for a city facing a financial emergency. This eight-member review team concluded that three of those nine were severe enough to warrant a state takeover. One. One. The city had failed to eliminate its general fund deficit in the two-year period preceding the end of fiscal year 2010. Two. Two. The city failed to comply with an approved deficit elimination plan and... Three. three. The city had a structural operating deficit in its general fund. The city went into receivership on December 1st, 2011. And we decided to write a play about it. <laughs> One of the first people that we spoke to was Paul Jordan, a lecturer at Mont Community College. So where were you when you found out that there was going to be a manager in Flint? I was at home on my computer reading it on M Live, And my initial reaction was, I mean, the timing absolutely stinks because it was election day. No way in hell was that a coincidence. 
The announcement that Flint was going into state receivership was made on November 6th, Election Day, the day that Dane Walling was re-elected mayor. Hey, I've read the report, and it was pretty obvious the governor was going to do that. I anticipated it would be after the election. I thought it was particularly rude to do it on that day. It was a dick move. Nair Shuli, a local community organizer, and it probably suppressed some of the vote. It's like, why vote for a mayor? They're not going to have any power. Election day is supposed to be considered with a certain degree of reverence. I mean, in a democracy, elections are a sacrament. And you know what? You don't mess with the sacrament. It was just after 3 o'clock when the state treasurer called me. I had taken the day off because I was going to be out campaigning, and I saw that it was the treasurer. The treasurer informed me that the governor was going to accept the recommendation that Flint get an emergency manager, and he was calling me because that press release was going out within an hour. Flint City Councilman Dale Wayhill. I was riding around to polling places, checking out the results of the mayoral election, and I got a text that told me the EM's coming and the governor's announcing it in two hours. You know, a lot of people have said that it's not a coincidence the announcement was made on that day. But how did it make you feel? Oh, it, it was a terrible feeling because I was literally out asking people to go vote. And of course that vote still matters because the imposition of PA4 doesn't change the fact there is a mayor and city council members. But the authority of those positions obviously changes drastically. It's not a coincidence the announcement was made that day. Nothing the government does that's that significant is done without some thought. What the agenda was, I don't understand. <laughs> Due to our condition, I was honestly kind of hopeful the governor would appoint the right person who would take some of our views in time. We went to city council. They could have appealed the decision, but they decided not to. There was a seven to two vote. Councilman Neely made the motion to appeal, and I was in the seven that went against his motion. My rationale was I did not think that the facts were in dispute. The governor appointed a group of analyzers who looked it over and talked to our finance team. I'm sworn to uphold the laws of the state. I didn't feel you could appeal it if you don't like the decision. Our mayor went to take classes that the emergency manager takes, so the city council probably thought he'd be appointed and have extra powers. On November 29th, Michael Brown is named the emergency manager I've got about a 37-year career in what I call public service. I started out in the nonprofit sector in the mid-70s. I worked for the Michigan Association of Counties and the Flint Board of Education. And for four years, I was the government relations director, community development director for the mayor of the city of Flint. I've worked with nonprofits, the Red Cross, the United Way, and in 02, I went to Sierra Leone. I worked at a youth center and wrote programs and organized events. This was a country that had 10 years of civil war. So the kids that came to us were child soldiers. So they were victims and perpetrators at the same time. We came back in the spring of 2003. There had been an embezzlement at the Lansing United Way office. So from 2003 to 2008, I was the director of the United Way. But of course, my heart was back here in Flint. The community had been so great to us and I just felt like I wanted to make a contribution. I started working for the Chamber of Commerce and I wasn't there six weeks when some people approached me and said, how would you like to be the mayor for six months? I said, what the heck? <laughs> so in 09, I was the interim mayor of Flint for six months. And after that, I was the director of the Flint Area Reinvestment Office. Where were you when you got the call about becoming the emergency manager? I was driving to a meeting when I got the phone call. So someone said, all right, Brown, if the city goes into receivership, would you be open to serving? I didn't think, which I normally do. I said, sure. The next thing I know, my name was being submitted and I was involved in a whole interview process. Some people have called you a dictator. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those people? The one thing I would say in taking this job is, you cannot have a thin skin. I know I'm going to be called every name in the book, and I have. I was able to put a team together that was competent and would focus on getting the job done and not be concerned about the criticism. It's like I've said from the beginning, it's not like we have all the right answers. 
Uh, basically, you just have to sit around and look at all your options. You gather your facts. And then you've got to make some decisions, too. In February 2012, Mike Brown held a series of community engagement meetings in each of the city's nine wards. The second or third public meeting was the most volatile. All of them were well attended. All of them had approximately 150 people. In this particular one, people were coming up to the the meeting at the library was incredibly intense. It was like political theater. Well, a lot of people were really concerned. I mean, water rates were going up, and people wanted to know what would be done about the high rate of homicides in the city. Yeah, but I think a lot of people were just confused. I mean, even I was. The city's had a financial manager before, and there was already a law on the books, so why did we need a new one? I think it's really important that we try to explain this in our play. That's easy. Picture it. Dense pine forest as far as the eye can see. <laughs> Attractive commodities to the lumber industry, which, for better or worse, cleared the land. Yeah. <laughs> Those rich lumber re resources helped fuel the production of carriages. And eventually, carriages are traded in for cars. A few decades later, after 44 days of sit-down strikes, unionism strengthens the labor movement and produces years of prosperity for Flint families. <laughs> There's almost everything in the city of Flint. Yes, let's go shopping. Do I have anything right here? Lush forests? Then not. Then not. A few mid-century decades of good, yeah. even great, <laughs> times for the city. You heard him. But the next 50 years are filled with the haze of deindustrialization, oh. followed by tax base decline and all of the associated problems. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I invest everything in the city of Flint? <laughs> in 1986, by circuit court decision, Louis Schimmel is appointed the receiver in charge of the city of Ecorse after they go through a $6 million deficit. Two years later, Governor Blanchard and the state legislature passed Public Act 101, which would later be used if it were deemed that a financial emergency existed. Is this all right? Can I get everything else? Yeah, you got it. Okay. All right, now this is where it gets complicated. Okay. Two more years later, in 1990, Governor Blanchard signs Public Act 72 into law. This more formal emergency manager law allowed the state to negotiate consent agreements with local officials to resolve fiscal emergencies. The act was used by both Democratic and Republican governors in the next 20 years in communities like Flint, Highland Park, Benton Harbor, and Ecorse. In 2011, Republican Governor Rick Snyder and the Republican majority in the state legislature approved a new law, Public Act 4. <laughs> This new emergency manager law gave sweeping powers to the state appointed person in charge. It allowed for EMs to cancel union contracts, negate the power of elected officials from mayor to city council, sell off public property, and even dissolve municipalities. This was a law that was repealed in the November 2012 election. And there she goes. And that, my friends, is how we got here. Okay, okay. Okay, that is a lot of information to digest. Thank you. I have to admit, I'm not entirely sure what the differences are between the laws. We need to be extremely clear what changed between PA4 and PA72. How much clearer can we be? I give up. You do it. All right, all right. It's quite simple, really. PA72 allowed for an emergency financial manager to be appointed to a joint group of local and state officials. The EFM, as it was called, had the power to renegotiate collective bargaining agreements, but unlike the PA4 emergency manager, they cannot throw out those contracts entirely. Now, the EFM of PA72 may consolidate departments of local government and transfer functions interdepartmentally. They have the ability to add or remove heads of departments, but they may not remove elected officials clerks, or any ombudsman position. 
Now, an ombudsman is the citizen's advocate against government abuse. <laughs> now, the EM of PA4 can act in a much more unbridled fashion. Mike Brown, Flint's EM, flexed his power in the first few days of office by firing the city ombudsman, <laughs> among others. Poor guy. Aww. Aww. Come on. It's all right. To further understand emergency manager legislation, we spoke with Dr. Jason Kosnowski, Associate Professor of Political Science at U of M Flint. His research assistant, Faith Finholm, also joined the conversation. I've known the theory behind the emergency manager for quite some time. It's the shock value. You create the crises to get people to do things that they would never normally do. It's an old tactic. Well, I have to admit, I was shocked Rick Snyder, one, was able to pass some of the proposals and laws. I was more shocked he was able to pass Public to Act Four, and there was no outcry. We have this governor, right, who presents himself as this innocuous, nice, nerdy guy, but his policies are incredibly radical. Well, there are components of an emergency manager that are necessary, but why not give those to an elected official as opposed to an emergency manager? To say that we are in an emergency now it's ludicrous because these things have been going on for so long and they are products of choices. There are still incredibly well-off parts of this state and certain parts of this state aren't. There's always a financial emergency in Flint, but these prices are made by choices. I mean, this is not like a tornado. It's not like a plague of locusts, but that's the way people want to portray it. These problems have been festering. Now, I don't think an emergency manager is the way to go. If a city has to file for bankruptcy, I understand it has effect, an effect on the state too. But your constituency has to learn it's their vote that led to this. I didn't grow up in Michigan, but learning about this place has been fascinating. The trajectory of Detroit going from nothing in the 1900s <coughs> to being the fastest growing city in the 1930s to being the apex of so many things in the 20th century and then this spectacular decline. It's indicative of so much that has happened. I don't think your government should be run like a business. Your government and state are supposed to be run as protectorate of the people. If you look at the mayor of Flint or Detroit, Benton Harbor, they have the hardest jobs in the world because they have to govern with these arbitrary lines. This is where my influence begins and this is where it stops. And the lines only matter to their decision making. It has nothing to do with their policies, with their economies, but they got to deal with these stupid freaking lines, which have been constructed over the years to include and exclude certain people. The lines on one hand don't mean anything, but if you were to cross the line, it means everything. You can live in Flint and be so far removed. Whether you're in Flint or Grand Blanc, you can visually tell when you are. Whether you are in Detroit or Gross Point, Gross Farms, there's, there's so many Gross Points that's out there, you know? I, I never remember which one is which, but if you were to cross the line, it's amazing. I don't think that leaders are necessarily bad people. My main issue is you're taking away rights of citizens, taking away their right to vote. Where does that stop? Okay, I think I'm finally starting to wrap my head around this. Obviously, we know what's going on in Flint, but what about other cities that have been affected by PA4? And don't forget about the school districts. Right, school districts too. Well, John Conyers, the Democratic representative of Michigan's 14th district, he wrote a report. Right, the Conyers report. Right, which spells it out pretty, pretty well, I think. Uh, let's see here. Okay, the new EM law, that's PA4 he's talking about, had the effect of immediately broadening the authority of the current EMs operating in the Detroit Public Schools, Pontiac, E-Course, and Benton Harbor. And it was used to appoint the new EMs in Flint for the second time and the Highland Park Public Schools. In addition, under the EM law, financial reviews have been initiated for Inkster, the city of Detroit, and the Muskegon Heights schools. And I mean, this thing was published in February 2012, so things have obviously changed since then. Right, because initially Detroit was going to enter into a consent agreement with the state. That basically means that the local officials will agree to undertake certain actions to address the fiscal problem. Oh, and so the city council and the mayor would remain in charge, right? In theory, but they might end up getting an emergency manager after all. Well, what do we have on Benton Harbor? Anything? Oh, I met a couple of guys from Flint who got arrested at a protest in Benton Harbor. Great. What do they tell you? Benton Harbor's going through the same thing we are, more or less. The surrounding areas, you know, broke, violent, just like Flint. 
But there, the main thing is one of their crowning jewels, Jean Clock Park, was sold by their emergency manager. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the way the emergency manager situation has played out in that community. I knew it was happening. One of the things that happened was the selling off of a public park on Lake Michigan to the developers of a private golf course that was then bringing the PGA Tour. Before coming to such a drastic decision, there had to be a conversation, you know? The, the, the segregation in Michigan is as bad as anywhere, whether it's Detroit, Flint, or any of these communities. In Benton Harbor, it seems even more exaggerated. I don't know how they cannot have more shame about it. So they have the PGA Pro Tour there, and a protest is staged drawing attention to that event. People are, are chanting and clapping. Some people have megaphones, you know? It's a protest. I tooted a horn just to sand dune over from where the golf tournament was, mm -hmm. and I got a noise violation ticket in a public park Were you in the middle of the afternoon. For speaking out against the actions of the emergency manager. Were you riding a bike? No, it was part of the protest. <laughs> My friend had brought the horn. He let me hold it for a second. Couldn't resist giving it a toot. <laughs> I saw another protester who I'd spoken with earlier, so we sat down and started talking. As someone else passed, he said, Hey, did you hear someone got a ticket for honking a horn? I'm like, yeah, it was this horn. And he's like, why don't you honk it? So I said, sure. Doot, doot. Before I know it, this cop comes up and snatches me up by the shoulders. He's a big guy, he says, you're coming with me. Did he give you a citation? Yeah, he gave me the misdemeanor violation, which is a criminal charge and could be on my record. So how many times do you have to go back out there? Five. So you have to go back out there to get something figured out? Yeah, sure. I've made special requests, but what am I going to do? This case could have important implications for any protest movement. If making noise can result in you getting arrested, how are we free to protest? In March, a lawsuit was filed claiming the state violated Michigan's Open Meetings Act in appointing Mike Brown because his financial review team recommended his appointment behind closed doors. The intent of the Open Meetings Act is to strengthen the right of all Michigan citizens to know what goes on in government by requiring public bodies to conduct nearly all business in open meetings. March 20th, Ingham County Circuit Court Judge Rosemary Ocalina rules in favor of the lawsuit, removing Mike Brown from power and putting power back in the hands of the mayor and city council. The Flint Journal. Get out of here. In Flint Journal article dated March 20th, Aquilina states, The Open Meetings Act is as important as our Constitution. We can't operate behind closed doors. However, only a few days later, the State Court of Appeals overturns that ruling, stating that financial review teams are not subject to the Open Meetings Act. Mike Brown is immediately reinstated as Flint's emergency manager. In March, Mike Brown writes a guest blog for the Huffington Post Detroit titled, Charting a Course for Lasting Solvency. The following is an excerpt from that blog. months after the local government and school district fiscal accountability act was signed into law i was appointed as emergency manager for flint in flint we are concentrating our efforts on the city's future growth prosperity and financial solvency in addition i have identified two other areas of concern public safety and infrastructure development public act 4 allows emergency managers to take a holistic approach to solving the city's problems. Managers have the authority to seek partnerships and cooperative agreements with other units of government. The law also opens the door for private sector options for service delivery. Emergency managers have the ability to make policy changes that are not necessarily popular, but in the best interest of the city and its residents. While it's true, the law gives broad powers to an emergency manager. It doesn't require the use of these powers. My role is to judiciously apply the law. I do this by working together with elected officials, leaders, and residents. My hope is Split will be on a solid course for lasting solvency and continued positive growth. The goal is to set cities on a path for sustainability and to prevent any reoccurrence of a crisis situation.
In early April, several city unions reached tentative contract agreements with the financial manager's office. Trent Farnsworth, a president of Flint Firefighter Union Local 352. I just want to be at the table. We understand the times, and we had a concession package a little different than the one they had. Wasn't much. It approached 15%. We ended up with something approaching a 20% reduction instead. We renegotiated contracts under PA 72, something that both sides could live with. We lost night bonuses and some holiday pay because we understood the environment. We would have settled for 15%, and hopefully they would have taken into consideration the EMS proposal I submitted. They had it sitting on their desk. Their explanation, look, there's no political will to implement it. It brought in 720000 in its first year, and by the end of its fifth year, it would have produced over $2.1 million to the city's coffers. Farnsworth said that the Flint Fire Department is the busiest per capita in the nation. However, the new, they're underfunded, and the new contract didn't even attempt to address that. We have been six years without safety boots, which are critical to our work, but we have to buy them on our own. We have to hold on to what we have. I know that there is an effort to impose a right to work legislation, and I will fight it. At the end of April, Brown issues a dozen executive orders, including concessions for two city unions and the adoption of the budget for 2013. This includes a $66 street light assessment and a $143 waste collection tax, replacing a free mills waste collection tax. On the same day, the Stand Up for Democracy Coalition announced they had collected enough signatures to place the repeal of Public Act 4 on the November 2012 ballot. I was the field organizer for Stand Up for Democracy, the legal entity that challenged and eventually turned over Public Act 4. Now you explain to us how this movement got started. There's this guy from Detroit I know. He's the executive director of this urban policy think tank called Michigan Forward. And I have a friend who's part of the city council in Pontiac. The entire time he's been there, they've had an emergency financial manager. When PA4 was signed into law, he was just like, well, how about we appeal that law? They formed a coalition, brought together some folks, and they asked me. They were like, eh, we'll put together some money and pay for the petitions. <laughs> it took a long time because there was no money paying people to collect signatures. So it was pretty much the people who were really passionate about democracy who just jumped out there and became leaders in their own communities. Bishop Jeff Bernal Jefferson of Faith Deliverance Center Church. It's been a long journey. We started the petitions in April 2011 because right away it was clear that Public Act 4 violated our rights. It took our voice and our vote away. Amy Harden, blogger and founder of democracytree.com. Well, I found out about it and so did a bunch of other people and we were all appalled. And Northern Michigan is a very conservative area, though Traverse City itself has a more progressive core. Latrell Holmes, pastor of the Greater Galilee Baptist Church. After the adoption of PA4, we held a meeting, and Pastor Jefferson did a wonderful job of letting us know we should watch this legislation. After I began to read, I saw that within this law, nothing was barred to this appointed individual whose only check and balance is the state legislature and the governor. But I also saw that there was a piece within this law that would allow for continued local governance, the local advisory council. Pastor Holmes was asked by Mike Brown to serve on his advisory council. I believed they were going to ask me, and when the call came through, I had made up my mind. I wanted to be a part of this. We went all over, not just Flint, not just Genesee County, but Detroit, Benton Harbor, Grand Rapids, Saginaw. We went all over getting petitions signed. People started marching in downtown Traverse City about the law. It was 20 degrees out, we had probably 400 people marching. Our local newspaper was right there. They didn't peek to see what was going on. And even though the local media didn't pick it up, we were on every street corner with petitions. It was a grassroots movement. We're very proud of that. In the eight local municipalities that were affected, you certainly see more involvement from all level of residents. Here in Flint, I know what it's done for the local faith leaders. It's made us more aware and gotten us most involved in what's going on. We needed 156,000 signatures in order to get the repeal of Public Act 4 on the ballot. We took 225,000. Once you turn in your signatures, the Secretary of State has to make sure that all the signatures are valid. Once the signatures are valid, the Board of Canvassers has to certify the petitions. The Board has two Democratic and two Republican appointees. The rationale is that anything that gets put on the ballot is going to have bipartisan support. They ended up voting along party lines. 
The two Democrats voted to certify the signatures. The two Republicans voted not to. The petitions were challenged by a different group, Citizens for Fiscal Responsibility, who told the board that, amongst other issues, the petitions were printed in too small a font size. What? Oh, really? They couldn't challenge the amount of signatures. So they were like, oh, it's too small. Now, their excuse was people didn't know what they were signing, which I knew was a lie. I wear glasses to read. I didn't have to have glasses on in order to read it. According to an MLive article dated April 26, 2012, Attorney John Pirich, representing Citizens for Fiscal Responsibility, told the board that... Headlines in the petition were not published in size 14 print. Are you kidding? What? And the oh, board did not right. have the authority to certify them. In the same MLive article, Herb Sanders, representing Stand Up for Democracy, called attempts to discredit his group's efforts. Minimally disingenuous and borderline perjury. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah but wait, it gets better. Let's see here. In an article from the Detroit News, it states, leading up to Thursday's vote, questions were raised about two of the board members, Jeffrey Timmer and Julie Matuzak. Matuzak, a Democrat, is the political director of the American Federation of Teachers, and she actually helped get uh, signatures to get the repeal on the ballot. And Timmer, a former Michigan Republican Party executive director, is a partner at the Sterling Corporation political consulting firm in Lansing. Bob LeBrant, the firm's general counsel, filed the challenge to the petitions for Citizens for Fiscal Responsibility, which had the same address as Timmer's firm. It wasn't finished. <clears throat> In recent weeks, MSNBC liberal host Rachel Maddow has likened Timmer and Matuzak to being in the position of the pitcher and the umpire in the issue. You're out! April 30th. Protesters opposing PA4 take their message to Flint City Hall. Protesting what they believe to be taxation without representation, they stage a Mad Hatter's Tea Party in front of City Hall. Although their boisterous protest ends peacefully, another protest a few days later led by Pastor Reginald Flynn ends with him being arrested and detained in Flint City Jail. After some decisions have been made by Mike Brown, I felt like I needed to make a statement. I knew if I would have consulted with my family, my colleagues, and members of the church, they would have did their best to discourage me. But I felt like I needed to make a strong statement. So I took a page out of the old civil rights movement and demonstrated with the full intent that I would probably go to jail. And I did just that. I took my bullhorn and I suffered the consequences. I have a great deal of respect for both the former and current EFM. The concerned pastors and I had three meetings with the prior and current EFM. I remember when we went before them and said, the community simply cannot handle the water rate increase. They said, we know the community can't handle the water rate increase, but we're gonna do it anyway. After that, I just felt like the meetings were to gauge our anxiety level. According to an MLive article dated May 4th, Pastor Flynn's arrest came after more than half an hour of erratic and frightening behavior inside Flynn City Hall. Many people are saying to me now what sparked this growing sense of opposition. It touches me when people say, Pastor Flynn, you going to jail sparked the movement. It led to our opposition being more vocal. While being detained, Pastor Flynn writes a letter titled, A Letter from the Flint City Jail, inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King's essay, A Letter from the Birmingham City Jail. <coughs> A week later, a huge crowd, led by local pastors and faith leaders, gathered on the front lawn of City Hall, and Pastor Flynn read his letter. We, we shall welcome someday. Let him speak. From that letter. Dear Mr. Michael Brown, <clears throat> while confined to the Flint City Jail for what you describe as erratic and frightening behavior, and making accusations against you and your staff. I thought about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous essay, A Letter from the Birmingham City Jail. Mm -hmm. To understand the motives behind my nonviolent protests, it is important to be familiar with the historic context of Dr. King's arrest. Yes. Teach. His letter was a response to a statement titled A Call for Unity, mm -hmm. 
which argued that the battle against legalized racial segregation should be fought solely in the courts. Mm -hmm. uh, the clergy, city officials, law enforcement, and business leaders all criticized Dr. King for causing trouble in the streets of Birmingham. <laughs> against the clergyman's assertion that the protests and demonstrations were against the law, he argued that not only was civil disobedience justified, mm -hmm. but that one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Mr. Brown, in lieu of the erroneous, exaggerated, and embellished report you made regarding my actions, I can assure you that my alleged verbal tirade was nothing more than a direct, mm -hmm. yeah. nonviolent, mm -hmm. yeah. civil disobedient protest against the implementation and execution of, a, of Michigan's emergency manager law as practiced in Flint, Michigan. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would venture to say, however, that your tirade of executive decisions have become the veritable embodiment of erratic and frightening behavior. Yeah. Well, yeah. Frightening stuff. It is reasonable to conclude your actions are far more erratic, mm -hmm. threatening, mm -hmm. and frightening to Flint residents than the use of my $50 bullhorn. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Application of the emergency manager law has removed our basic constitutional protections. Mm -hmm. yes, the expansive use of state power and the rise of the prison industrial complex have spurred the mass incarceration of African American and Hispanic men and boys. Just shame. In 2012, excessive police force is still a reality for many African American males. I can speak from firsthand experience. Talk to him, Pastor. On May 3rd, I engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. I was not asked to leave the building. No. no. I was not warned to cease from speaking. No. no. I was not asked to place my hands behind my back. I was not informed that I was under arrest. No. I was not read my Miranda rights. I did not resist arrest. Mm -hmm. I was approached and slammed to the cement floor. Handcuffs were placed on my wrists so tight my hands became numb and swollen. My arms were so restricted that my shoulders began to sting with excruciating pain. One officer placed his knee and full weight on the small of my back. Another officer placed his hands around my neck to keep my face to the cement. The weight was so heavy. I could barely breathe. So With you, Pastor. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going, Pastor. When I look around today, I realize in spite of the victories that were won during the Civil Rights era, much more remains to be done. Yes. 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 We are regressing, not progressing. We can't yes. No, no. We are under a stop taking. Yes. The lessons from the Civil Rights Movement make it clear as to what we must do today. Yes. And I can hear the voice of Dr. King declaring in these perilous times. Don't you get weary. We shall overcome someday. We're going to pray. Fight for equality. Fight for justice. And that justice will die by grace and righteousness like a master string. We now fast forward to June when the state appeals court declines to convene a special panel to decide a dispute over the font size on petitions. Well, I guess size doesn't matter after all. <laughs> really? Come on. Come on, you knew we were going to use that line. Sure, sure, sure. At the end of April, a Michigan Supreme Court ordered the State Board of Canvassers to certify a referendum of Public Act 4 for the November ballot. The petition is soon certified. PA 4 is immediately suspended, and the previous version of the law, PA 72, goes into effect. Because of a technicality in PA 72 that prevents any former city official from serving as emergency manager, Mike Brown is forced to step down. But before leaving office, Brown signed 63 resolutions, including putting a six mills public safety tax before voters and selling the city-owned Genesee Towers to Uptown Reinvestment Corporation Seriously? for $1. $1? $1. $1. Ed Kurtz is appointed as the city's new emergency financial manager a position he held during the city's first state takeover, and he appoints Mike Brown as the new city administrator. Ed Kurtz respectfully declined to be interviewed for this project. I suppose now would be an excellent time for intermission. <laughs> yes, okay.
hate having to listen to myself during this interview. Is I always sound so inarticulate. Well, that's because most of the time you are. <laughs> Shut up. What are you doing? I'm uh, just looking up some pro and anti PA4 videos on the internet. Oh, anything we can use? Uh, not really. All right, everyone, so. let's get started. Thank God you brought. I take you all had the chance to look over the rough draft of Act One over the weekend. Yeah. You. Any thoughts? Well. Chronologically, I think we've covered all of the major events, but there's just so much information, I'm afraid we're going to confuse our audience. Well, it is an overwhelming subject. I, I like a lot of what we have already, but I think it's pretty heavy on stuff from people who oppose PA4. Well, have we had any luck finding opposing or alternative viewpoints? Well, I, uh, I've been trying to attend some of the meetings at U of M College, the Republican Society, uh, but I haven't had any takers. And I also tried to call the Genesee County Republican Party. And they advised me to contact the mayor of Schwartz Creek, and well, I haven't gotten a call back. And as expected, the Mackinac Center never responded. <laughs> well, what do we do if nobody wants to talk to us? I guess we could just say that in the play. Well, I think we need to be careful that we don't paint this as purely a, a Democrats versus Republicans issue. Well, it kind of is that. Not necessarily. Mm. Well, hold on. Do you still have that article from Mother Jones? Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's here somewhere. Um, Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay. All right, now the piece is called Michigan's Hostile Takeover, published on February 15th. Now, we briefly mentioned Louis Schimmel in Act One, but under PA4, he was actually appointed as the EM for the city of Pontiac. Now, according to this article, uh, Schimmel got to work quickly, firing the city clerk, city attorney, and director of public works, and outsourcing several city departments. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, Schimmel has proposed putting nearly every city property up for sale, including City Hall, the police station, fire stations, water pumping stations, the library, the golf course, and two cemeteries. <laughs> Who buys a cemetery? Who buys a cemetery? Oh. I have no idea. Right. All right. Now, a little later on, it says, uh, with an indefinite term and a city salary of $150,000, oh. Schimmel doesn't answer to anyone but the governor at whose pleasure he serves. Asked by radio station WJR if, you're, if the emergency manager law hands power over to a dictator, Schimmel sighed, I guess I'm the tyrant in Pontiac, then, if that's the way it is. $150,000? Oh, that is chump change. Trent Farnsworth said that Mike Brown gets paid $172,000 a year. He's the highest paid city administrator in the country. Now, this is the same article about the Mackinac Center, right? Right. Uh, you know, Jason Kosnowski called uh, the Mackinac Center the evil death star of Michigan politics. <laughs> we can't like, say that. Oh, we can say we that. Can We're, that. We're going to use it. Okay. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> so, Louis Schimmel used to work for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, which is a free market think tank that shares his enthusiasm for privatizing public services. The center has received funding from the foundations of conservative billionaire Charles Koch, the Walton family, and Dick DeVos. Guys, this is huge. There's big money behind this. Okay, okay. I think that's an entirely different play right there. See, but I think it's important we at least mention this. I agree. Okay. We'll mention it. <laughs> Do we have any interviews that give us a more balanced view of this whole thing? I want you guys to listen to some of my interview from Rob Claddy. He makes some really good points. I can actually see both sides of this, and I can see that Mike Brown or whoever was in charge is given the task of trying to balance budgets to make us stable. We are fooling ourselves if we think we can have public services without the finances to do it. Ultimately, it would not be sustainable. Let me fast forward a little bit. I guess my hunch is, yes, something needs to be done. We seem to have a legacy of not being able to be fiscally responsible, and the last thing I want to see is state intervention in that, but I don't know what else to do. To give an extreme example, I feel like it's the parent's responsibility to care for the child. But if they are not doing it, then there are provisions in place where the child will not be harmed. So I'm not for federal control, not for state control, but when we cannot get our financial act together and the citizens suffer, that is when I become more open to an emergency manager. Now if I actually thought the state wanted to take over the cities, it might change my mind, but I believe the last thing they want to do is to take over. You know, I think a lot of people are in the same boat. They see both sides of this issue. Oh, I had a great conversation with Harold Ford. He works for the Beecher School District, and he was able to look at this from a completely different perspective. I understand the argument against the emergency manager law. I understand that there are locally elected officials and that when the state government steps in and usurps the power of those officials, then that's an anti-democratic move. 
I also understand that there are racial ramifications to this because the majority of urban centers and the majority of school districts having the emergency manager applied to them are predominantly African American. However, we have examples in our country's history of a more powerful government stepping in and checkmating the power of our smaller governments. For example, the Little Rock Public Schools in 1957 would not permit African American youngsters to their school system until the federal government sent troops and desegregated the Little Rock Public Schools. That would be an example of the federal government using its power to checkmate the power of local government. I think it's analogous to what's happening now. My focus is on education because that's where I've spent my career for over 40 years. And I know that most of the school systems under the, under the gaze of the emergency manager law are predominantly African American. And so the charge of racism is leveled. You're taking over black schools and not taking over white schools. However, I would argue that it would be, that it would be racist not to protect the rights of those children to have a good education. If local officials had proven themselves incapable of providing the education that those kids need, then I would argue that if you don't go in, that that would be racism because you're allowing lives to be adversely impacted by incompetent or corrupt local officials who can't meet the, who can't meet the needs of those children. That's good stuff. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. This is too hard. Just drink some more coffee. Yeah, I think we're going to need something stronger by the end of the day. All right, moving on. I think we need to hear some voices from people who live outside of Flint. These are some excerpts of uh, interviews I did with Tim Lamb and the uh, Grand Blank resident. I have always paid attention to what's going on in Flint. Even though I haven't resided there for almost 30 years, I've always paid attention to Flint politics. I know Grand Blank doesn't agree, but I believe Flint is the anchor for the community. I live in Grand Blank Township, so I'm not a part, I'm not a part of Flint. However, we have to be concerned about what's going on because it does trickle out to the surrounding communities. The first emergency manager situation, I don't know if I agreed with that. But it did improve things as far as the financial stability of the surrounding community. The second time around, I started paying more attention to what was going on in the city council. <clears throat> this is where I start to point fingers. The city council just doesn't get it. Dane Walling is trying to improve things in the city. And every time he turns around, they are telling him no. I do think the present mayor is trying to make a change. He's in a tough position, and it goes back to no money. Or just like a household would do. If you only have $100 for groceries, you only spend $100. City government is a business. If your debits don't equal your credits, then your ass is in jail. How can you continue spending when you're not bringing anything else in? There's no money coming in. There's no money to go out. However, you still have all these services that need to be provided. Eventually, the governor says, listen. Flint can't pay its bills. What can we do to hold Flint accountable? The mayor doesn't have any control because the city council says no. And the city council isn't concerned. All they care about is getting reelected. But people are elected because we believe what they say and what they're trying to do. Just because you have that job doesn't mean you're entitled to it for the rest of your life. We have to hold our elected officials accountable. If we don't start holding people accountable, we're always going to have the same thing happen. Williamson was just a joke. I mean, what happened during that administration was just total stupidity. I think a lot today can be blamed on him. At least this way, someone's making these decisions. If Walling were making these decisions, he wouldn't be in office next time. He'd be out and someone else would come in and we'd have this vicious cycle all over again. At least this way, someone is appointed to make the difficult decisions. The community is going to feel the impact. What is that doing to taxpayers? It's driving them out. Well, it still needs some more work, but I think we've given ourselves something to think about. Now you'll have to excuse me. I have a phone interview with someone in the Treasury Department. For the record, could you state your name and role inside the Treasury Department? Roger Frazier. I'm the Deputy State Treasurer for Local Government Services. I was hired to oversee the Bureau of Local Government and implement the PA4 law. Great. Thanks. And uh, thanks so much for your time. One of the goals of our project is to demystify PA4. So how would you explain PA4 to your average Michigan citizen? Well, I think for people who live in a city where finances are not well managed, there is trouble with increasing rates of taxes and decreasing rates of services, particularly what's happened in the last four or five years with our economic troubles, 
There have been cities with really big problems with decreasing revenue so they cannot do the business of the city. In some cities, people have been able to handle it and make the right decisions, and in some cases, that's just not true. As a consequence, there have been efforts to raise taxes, and if they can't raise taxes, they cut services and people get laid off. It's, it's in those circumstances where the feeling is that, that there needs to be some sort of intervention, and that is what PA4 is all about. Well, what do you have to say to people who claim that PA4 is anti-democratic? Well, oh, and I think you take out the authority or cross the authority of a mayor or city council. It's fairly self-evident that goes against representative democracy. <laughs> But we have democracy at many levels in our country and in our state. The fact is that our elected officials are, con our, our folks are continuing to be represented by elected officials, whether there is a mayor or council in legal standing or not. The idea of accountability on the local folks, it's something that's not well addressed in our charters at a local level and in the state constitution that says what happens when the decisions they are making causes a financial mess. There needs to be some sort of means of correcting that. Well, I wonder if you could give me some examples of school districts or cities. I think it's interesting to point out that PA 72 was in existence until March of 2011, and under those provisions, there was really no way to enact collective bargaining issues. Uh, and all the cities that were affected, collective bargaining uh, uh, dominated how much uh, people get paid, their benefits, and the working rules under which they operate. It's only been with PA 4 that we have had ways of addressing those issues. So, if you take a look at examples of success, the most meaningful one is eCourse, which has been under emergency manager leadership twice in the last few decades. More recently, they're operating under a balanced budget, and they're actually creating a small surplus. <laughs> they're actually on the verge of coming out of receivership. Another example is Highland Park, which has been under PA 72, came out of that, and fell back in again by running themselves into a financial hole. Today, Highland Park does not have an emergency manager, but the state is helping the mayor and city council work out a way of balancing their budgets. Their most recent analysis shows that uh, Highland Park has a pension obligation that over time will cost them millions and millions of dollars. It's going to take some imagination and outside input before we can fix that. There are many cities that have benefited from these laws, but there are still some places where the issues go back 30 and 40 years, and it is virtually impossible. <laughs>
took a law center to Troy filed a lawsuit, claiming that PA-72 was permanently repealed when PA-4 was signed into law. On September 27th, Governor Rick Snyder wrote a guest column for MLive.com. He was urging citizens to vote yes on the emergency manager ballot proposal. The following is an excerpt from that column. Michigan's communities and schools are at a critical fork in the road this November. Proposal 1 is a pending ballot referendum to repeal Public Act 4. PA4 is an important tool designed to help our state's struggling communities and schools with financial emergencies and to protect residents and students as well as Michigan taxpayers. Millions of dollars in debt are piling up. Bills aren't being paid. Lights can't be turned on. Police and firefighters can't do their job. Children are at risk of not having schools to attend, all of which can have a disastrous impact on our economic recovery. That is where PA4 comes in. The law was updated to provide additional early warning indicators to help communities and schools avoid a financial emergency, and if they are in an emergency, to appoint an emergency manager with more tools and ability to get the job done faster. It's not about Republicans or Democrats. Fiscal crises affect us all, and Michigan's emergency manager law has been around for decades. It's not about takeovers or control, but about helping communities get back on solid financial footing and adapt to changing circumstances and fiscal realities. In fact, I would far prefer never to have to appoint an emergency manager. That's a last resort. It simply allows the state to assist when local leaders have been unable or unwilling to make the tough decisions necessary to right the ship. It's not about circumventing collective bargaining agreements or voiding contracts, but about ensuring fair contracts and benefits while recognizing that the past status quo simply isn't sustainable anymore. It's not about voting rights. The law was passed after a thorough legislative process and robust public discussion. Emergency managers are accountable to me and to the state legislature, all of whom are elected. It's about working together. Michigan is the comeback state in the country, and we need to keep moving forward. That's why PA4 is an important, needed tool. Please join me in voting yes on Proposal 1 to retain the emergency manager law. As we move closer to the November elections, we began to ask people what they would like to see happen if PA4 was repealed. Paul Jordan had a lot to say on this matter. He criticized both of the old laws for failing to achieve lasting solutions. I think one of the defects of Public Act 4 and Public Act 72 is that they really don't do anything to increase the expertise of people governing a city on an ongoing basis. And the emergency manager can bring in whoever he wants. He can say, we're going to spend a million dollars and the best talent money can buy, and the city is on the hook for paying for that. Flint City Council Member Dale Wayhill. The city provides basic services like picking up the trash, 911 and fire, those kinds of things. Local units of government are creatures of the state under the state constitution. Cutting taxes for businesses and well-off individuals wasn't a good idea. They could have saved the state and not given certain tax cuts. They gave revenue away, which could have been used on basic services and still balanced the budget. One of the things that I think has been completely overlooked is a solution only the federal <laughs> government can provide. Quite frankly, we need a completely different health care system in this country because <laughs> ours is unsustainable. We have the most expensive system in the world. We don't have the best system in the world. No. No. Unless that's addressed, government at all levels is going to find itself under great stress. Flint, Flint Mayor Dane Wallen. As someone who sees how the city's finances actually work, there are a number of long-term legacy burdens I would like to see bundled together and paid for at a statewide or metropolitan scale. Because it's not the fault of today's taxpayers that 30 years ago, there was a union contract that let someone retire with 25 years of work and for the rest of her life receive Cadillac health care without ever having to go on Medicare. That's part of what's made the city less competitive, attracting new businesses and new families. I feel if that were dealt with more collectively, if we shared it more broadly, then we would have the resources we need. I don't know we can solve these problems just by taxing, raising revenues, or special fees. If we had wise representation at the state level, they would understand that maybe we can't afford things the way they have been. So we need to figure out how to do it more efficiently. But the state has to provide some revenue. Sure, we can do some things locally, but the state needs to do more. Right? Quite frankly, I think bankruptcy has its place too. 
Uh, if you're a corporation, you declare bankruptcy. If you're a person, you declare bankruptcy and you start over. I think there's circumstances under which that's appropriate. That's something the governor doesn't want because bond ratings will go down. <laughs> With the bankruptcy option, bondholders aren't going to get their money back. We've needed a simple, easy statewide business tax, but we haven't had local government revenue reform. We haven't had school district revenue reform. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to see the same kind of major reforms we've seen in other areas. It is pretty simple at the end of the day. <laughs> I would tax the hell out of the 1% and put it into the schools. <laughs> First yeah. and foremost, we have to have jobs. Mm -hmm. If you can put people to work, they can afford to buy a house. If they can afford to buy a house, then they can take pride in that property. And then you can start to turn communities around it. I moved here because of my standard of living, and my standard of living is decreasing. My, co my, my cost of living is increasing, and the st standard of living is decreasing, and I see it getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Well, Flint's never going to get out of financial trouble by the nature of the city we are. Uh, I, I, I would like to see the state require better land use plans. The city of Flint should have never gone 50 years without a comprehensive master plan. Yeah, yeah. Right. We have to realize that the goal of the 21st century is fundamentally different than the 20th century was. If we want our community to thrive, what things can we make sure they have? We need to stop thinking about how we can bring more money to this community and start thinking, how can we make our community healthy? My water bill is more than my mortgage. When I moved here for the five of us, it was like $60. Now it's like $250. I don't understand how people survive. I really don't. Well, the point at which the state takes over now is during a financial emergency. But these things have been developing for 20 years. Yeah, blaming the city for everything? Well, clearly, all the problems Flint is facing, we brought on ourselves. <laughs> Wrong! The problems that are happening in Flint are happening all across the nation because of 30-year decisions about how much money cities get from states. It's not going to get fixed overnight. Katrina was over in a matter of days. The recovery took years. The emergency here in Flint has been over for 40 years. How long is it going to take us to recover? November 12th, that's November 6th, 2012. Election day. <laughs> <laughs> So, take us back to election day. What happened? Election day, we got up early because I canvassed the communities to make sure all the voters got out. I had quite a few phone calls that day because November 6th is my birthday. It was very memorable. I, I just kept telling everybody else that called, I just got to get through this election to make sure everybody gets to the polls. Now, there were about 10,000 absentee ballots in Flint that could not be counted until after 8 o'clock. So I just kept saying, the polls are not closed yet. <laughs> we had promised to go to local 651, which was my local when I worked for General Motors. Members kept calling, saying, it passed. I said, do not call me until it is completely over. <laughs> I think about two or three, we were still waiting, and I went to bed. I knew we'd probably win in Flint because everyone was all hands on deck. We didn't know we were going to win until 4 o'clock on Wednesday morning. My niece started a new job on November 7th. She had to be there at 8 a.m. She calls me. She says, I walked to Dart Highway. I'm walking to my job. I said, I'll be there in a minute. I got up after her and I took her to the job. I forgot my phone at home and a hundred people had called by the time I got back. Here in Flint, we had something like 10,000. And in Detroit, it was something like 70,000. I was looking online and I kept refreshing it every 10 minutes. I'm like, we're at 88%. I think we're good. I was grateful. I said, what legwork won't do, prayer will do. Now, it wasn't a one man or a one person show. It, it was the people working together that brought about change. I was grateful for that. It was a victory for the grassroots movement. <laughs> well, now that the election's over, what's going to happen? Well, I'm back to being a volunteer because this is something that's really important for me. There are a lot of different options out there. Different lawsuits in Benton Harbor, here in Flint, Pontiac, Highland Park in Detroit, challenging the constitutionality of PA 72. We need to find something more equitable instead of where someone just comes in and tosses out the leadership. Well, I'm sure you've heard that there are already plans to pass the There's still work to be done. What are you afraid might happen? A watered down version of Public Act 4. 
Governor Snyder is going to have another one and ramrod it through legislature. If they attach an appropriation to it, the only way to repeal it is if the legislature repeals it or overriding it completely themselves. A lot of things that went on in Flint, Detroit just won't stand. The people stand up, fight, speak out. And that's what we, the people, are going to have to do. Now, I may not have what you have, but we all have something to bring to the table. And we're going to have to bring it to the table together. We're going to have to make some stone soup. <laughs> On November 7, 2012, the announcement was made that PA4 was voted down. In Flint, Ed Kurtz continues to serve as emergency financial manager under PA72, and Mike Brown continues to serve as city administrator. On December 5th, the administration of Governor Snyder unveiled a new emergency manager law, Public Act 436, or the Local Financial Stability and Choice Act. This new law promises to allow for greater input from local officials before a financial emergency is declared and gives local officials a choice between four options, a consent agreement, mediation, an emergency manager, or Chapter 9 bankruptcy. This new law also gives local officials more power to approve certain actions by an emergency manager or come up with alternative solutions providing equal savings. It promises to pay the salaries of emergency managers and makes it possible to remove an emergency manager if two-thirds of the local government vote in favor of removal. Flint will be grandfathered into PA 436 because the city is currently operating under PA 72. On December 12, the House passed PA 436 in a 63 to 46 vote during the lame duck session. Representative Kevin Cotter was the only Republican to join Democrats in voting no. The new law also includes an appropriation, making it referendum proof. The law will go into effect at the end of March 2013. On that same day, as multiple bills were quickly passed behind locked doors, over 10,000 protesters gathered on the lawn of the city council. Well, how do we feel? I feel like I don't know any more than I did when we started. I mean, I feel like if I was quizzed on what's going on with the new EM laws, I would probably only vaguely pass. I think we're fooling ourselves to think we can fit every aspect of the story into one play. This is bigger than any timeline or any slogan on a picket sign. And it's not like the story's over. You know, this project is about involvement. It's about commitment. It's about coming together as a community to solve a problem. The business of government is to serve the people. But when running government is treated like running business, then we, the stockholders, need to look at more than just our financial statements to understand the full effects. The politics will come and go, but this current caliber of leadership, this abandonment of ethics in our culture, and this manipulation of government, it, it feels like a cancer that's going to take us all down. And I hear a call to action, and I have never felt that way before. We're all accountable to the government, and the government is, or at least should be, accountable to the will of the people who empower it. That's democracy, no. It's the ideal we should always strive for. It's a form of government that should be controlled by the people. People yeah. are the ultimate source of political That's authority. Right. Yeah. Equal voice for everyone, regardless of class, race, status. It's a privilege. It was something we earned, and one man doesn't have the authority to take it away. It's everything to me. I couldn't imagine living without democracy. I need democracy. I have food and air. I was in Western Kenya during their last presidential election. In the village that I live, the way they voted is everybody gets a stone. You put the stone in your candidate's box. So let's say you're all holding stones. The ballot boxes don't show up. What do you do with your box? You throw them through windows. You throw them at people. Because you are losing your box. You are losing your privilege. Is this what democracy looks like? Is this what democracy looks like?
continue straight with into our dialogue session. So uh, I'm going to introduce Mona Yunus, who is going to facilitate our first dialogue uh, session for us this evening. Thank you, Mona. Gonna bring, bring that a little further. Sure. And uh, the cast is going to join us for this too. Uh, I just want to remind you, those of you that are watching remotely, uh, again, you can tweet us with comments or questions at, at shopfloorflint. Um, if you want to move down a little closer too, we've got a few empty seats here at the front. Uh, it might kind of make our conversation a little easier. Um, and as I mentioned before, we want this to be a dialogue, so we've kind of spoken at you now for uh, a little over an hour. We want to kind of hear your thoughts and your uh, reactions now too. So I'm going to kind of uh, pass things over to Mona and uh, we can kind of start the conversation. Can I just say, can we give another round of applause for this wonderful group of students and TV members? That was a lot of information to pack in, so I'm just really proud of those people here. Nick, you can come join us, please. Uh, and I, can I just add one more thing, too? Um, so I want to introduce a couple other people that are with us this evening who uh, were sort of featured on stage. Uh, <laughs> kind of joining now is uh, Nick Costa, who was one of the uh, the writing uh, team alongside me and also Jessica Batch uh, back here. We have a couple, <laughs> a couple other writers. I know uh, Beth Brooks, I think, is watching at home on the internet. So hi, Beth, thanks again. And, uh, and Kenny Indes, who's not here this evening too. Um, but yeah, we wanted Nick to join the conversation too. So, Mona? Great. Okay, so this is your chance to you know share your voice and your experiences and your perspective. And um, there will be people walking around with uh, megaphones, I believe? Uh, yeah, we can use the megaphones if we need to, or you can just uh, kind of use your, use your big voice. OK. So let's start by thinking back on the performance that you just witnessed. What are some words that you would choose to describe um, how you feel after watching it? Just popcorn style, shout them out. You're speechless. You did a good job. Can I just add to the, maybe we repeat those things so that people oh, okay. in the audience who don't hear, but also people uh, watching online can hear that? Yeah. There's a word on the right I don't think that's even. <laughs> <laughs> so we just heard a range of emotions, like overwhelmed, revolutionary, ready, wow, informed, a lot more. Um, anything else? Ashamed. Ashamed. Frustrated. How did this happen? Angry. Angry. So was there a specific line or an image that really stood out to you that really resonated? So the So in a nutshell, the last line about having stones in your hand and, and other things too um, from, the, from the play. What else, what else stood out to people? The letter from the Flint City Jail. Genesee, Genesee Tower, yeah. So we heard the small group of folks that's kind of running the show um, and really affecting people's lives in the networks behind the scenes and in the, the image of the police. You, 
used against the citizen. How much is the salary of that person? Yep, the astounding salary <laughs> for the emergency manager. repeat everything sure. can you use the microphone yeah I'm gonna ask that because um, I don't have to repeat every brilliant thing that's being said I'm gonna ask that we use the microphone <laughs> Jason could you say that again for the benefit of our online audience please Don't be shy to like really speak into it. Yeah, yeah so we can make sure we hear you.
I think that raises another really great question, which is what insights have you all gained about the emergency manager laws? So make up, just making up new, if when one law is repealed, another one gets brought back. I think it gets back to the, the um, having a small group of people make decisions mm -hmm. and that, you know, when one approach doesn't work and they have the political means, uh, they will just have another law come right back and do what they want to, you know, ultimately. I would say that there is no level. It's a constant build and it's a constant fight. You, you can never become complacent. If you want something, you have to constantly fight for it and because there's always going to be another side that wants something different.
And can I just say really quick for anybody who doesn't know, um, the city of Flint is actually currently undergoing its um, comprehensive master planning process. It's the first one that the city has, uh, next year the city will have a first, the first master plan since 1960. So if you live in Flint and you wanna get involved, um, I believe the website is imagineflint.com. Um, there's, you can, all the steering committee meetings are public, they're held at the, um, Flint Public Library, for the most part, um, is something to be attuned to, and it, and it is a solution, I think, that hopefully ultimately will take care of these really complex and, and broad-reaching issues in Flint. So um, what are your thoughts on whether this is an emergency, the crisis in Flint is an emergency? This, I mean, this is something that was addressed in the play, um, and some of the voices in the play were suggesting that emergency is maybe not an accurate portrayal of Flint's situation. What do you think?
Um, on leadership, sir, that's uh, one of my favorite parts in the play is during the Christian Rock Theater section. And uh, Paul Jordan essentially says that the main issue really is that, you know, you have these people that are brought in by a MEM or a Merchant Banking Manager, they're paid for the best of business even to balance the books, but then they don't preside in the community, and so that knowledge doesn't stay here. We fall back into it again. You know, as happened in Flint, we came out of a situation a few years ago, and then there weren't the brain trust in the city to keep us going back. Really important point when you uh, you need permanent leadership. You need people that know what's going on. You need them to reside in the community that they're working, or at least you need to have people that can take over for them beyond that point. <laughs> money in its coffers, that means everything is good, but then you have people on the other side that want quality of life. And they're not getting that in the first place, and especially when you cut a park, you know, Gene Clark Park, to sell that off, it's, you know, a major thing for that community, or in this community, you know, whatever, that they're trying to privatize trash. You feel really hurt by that, and it's because uh, they have these different set of priorities, these different values, that are not taken into consideration. One side has a choice, not the other. So there's a lot of different ways that we can be leaders um, around different issues in the community and there are actions that we can take. So has anybody in the audience been motivated to take action? And if so, in what way?
part of cast? I lived in the city my entire life. I had no idea what that law meant or what it was. It's just jargon. You have to put yourself in the position of the city council. You, there are avenues that you can learn that don't take up all of your time. There's information out there. If there's anything this place done for me, it's made it more important to me to say, hey, take a minute, read what's going on. Because what's in that paper today is something you're going to have to vote on tomorrow. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to end up with what we have. Any other ways people feel like getting involved or taking action as a result of what you've learned today? I think so. I heard somebody mention earlier the idea of like contacting like a local representative or state official. I always think that's maybe something that you know I try to do and, and I think if it's a case of sometimes it might feel that like people aren't going to listen or like bother reading that email or that phone call but I sometimes feel well if it's something you really feel strongly about keep sending emails and keep calling that number so the numbers are blocked then hopefully the message can come. But I think often, like, that's a really simple way to just, you know, if there's something that you're not happy about or if you have questions, like, actually contact that person. Yeah, nothing, nothing uh, gained if you, if you don't try. Exactly.
encourage everybody to continue this dialogue um, outside of the, you know, this sphere. Take it back to your families, to people in the community. Continue this conversation and um, really think about how each one of us, how, how you can get involved and be part of the change. Uh, I want to thank Mona for oh. facilitating the dialogue uh, this evening. Thank you for the question. And we, we do have some food outside, so we hope that you'll continue to stick around and eat with us and talk with us. Uh, I want to thank a couple people. Um, if it wasn't kind of clear from what he was saying, uh, Jason Kosnowski was one of the people we interviewed. If you were one of the people that we interviewed for our project and you're here in the audience, can you maybe stand so we can thank you? Because it's really impossible to make a play like this without people speaking to us. Um, Bob and Melody, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone there. If you're still watching in Detroit, Ann Arbor, anywhere else, um, thanks for tuning in. And uh, let's keep talking outside. And uh, surveys. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Um, would you need to keep these in front?